This episode is made possible by New Masters Academy, the world's absolute number one art school in the entire planet. Click the link down below for a free seven-day trial. Thank you, New Masters Academy. I am deep in the annals of your mind. I am deep in the annals of your mind. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Honey and Absinthe After Hours podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Vincent, a background designer for the Hollywood animation industry. And I'm Janet, the ex-Disney artist and independent creator, and this is a podcast about all things art, business, and, and whatever, whatever we, we feel like. Now today, today we're going to talk about how you're missing out if you didn't watch these movies in the year 2022. But before we get into it, make sure to like, subscribe, jingle all our bells and buttons. Please and thank you. Click those buttons, subscribe to our channel, subscribe if you haven't on Spotify. You are looking great. Usually I give you the spiel about how great you look today, though, is very, very serious, serious business. We took a lot of time and care watching a lot of movies in 2022, as we usually do. And we did, I I think, a really good job as to listing the top 10 movies we think are the best of the best in 2022. Yes, I think it's as someone who's really into Hollywood, potentially would like to make a movie one day it's very important to stay up to date and watch as many movies as possible including the modern ones as even though you know a lot of directors would say otherwise um so we're gonna have a list of 10 movies starting from 10 all the way to the number one best movie of the year And for each movie, we're going to give reasons as to why you should watch the movie, why it's placed in the placement it's placed, and hopefully it inspires you to watch these movies and, you know, support good cinema. Yes, hopefully you learn something from our watching of many, 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 many many movies. And uh, stick around to see who we will crown as the number one movie of the year. So Janet Chan, let's start all the way at the bottom. What is the 10th best movie of the year? There's lots of movies coming out, came out in 2022. Uh, Lots of Marvel movies, Batman, so many movies. What is the 10th best movie of the year 2022? I, we decided everything, everywhere, all at once. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, bold, bold choice to put in the very bottom, especially since <laughs> this movie is getting so much, we think, undeserved Oscar press. Mm-hmm. Uh, why did we put it in the very bottom of this list? It's a good movie, but it's 10 out of our top 10 because it's, in my opinion, an okay movie. It's n- There's nothing particularly stand out about it there's nothing particularly all that special about it other than the fact that it's an all asian american cast um i compared it to it's the closest thing to a marvel movie on our list Whoa. um what does that mean meaning it is structurally exactly the same as a Marvel comic book movie. There's a villain, there's a, uh, what's the word? Sidekick. Pro- pro- yeah, protagonist, sidekick. There's a multiverse. Um, it's structured exactly the same way with all the same heart-tugging moments. Um, because, in my opinion, that kind of make like it's done well it's executed well um but it does make it kind of basic like it's it's not reinventing anything it's not doing anything particularly new or revolutionary um it doesn't it actually didn't stick with me for a very long time after watching the movie so i it's not a knock that it's number 10 it's just to me it's kind of basic of, of basics of of good movies this year uh well last year yes i think uh michelle yo's fun and great short round is great but at the end of the day i remember thinking like wow that's a really interesting bold uh lot sensory overload of a movie (laughs) but just like a marvel movie you have your good guy and you have your bad guy and the good guy defeats the bad guy Mm -hmm. and uh 
I want to say that out of all the movies on this list, there's more to the other movies above this movie than just a simple good guy versus bad guy type of ordeal. Mm -hmm. Um, Would you agree that every movie that we're about to talk about after that goes above everything everywhere uh, has more complexity than just good guy versus bad guy? Yeah, I think for us, the reason why it's number 10 is because a movie needs to be more than just a decent movie for for it to rank in our top 10. It has to be memorable in some way. It has to have a unique story, unique acting, something that's more than just like, I guess, what like if you were to give it a score in a classroom in terms of screenplay, acting, all this stuff. Technically, Everything Everywhere would be an A+, plus, in my opinion. It's paint by numbers, a good Hollywood movie. But it, it, it it's not taking, in my opinion, all that much risk. Um, it's just, it, it, it does what it does well. <laughs> it does the Hollywood movie thing well. So who is this movie for, you think? I think that the people who would like this movie the most are people who in my opinion are layman moviegoers you typically go to the theater only for marvel movies comic book movies blockbuster movies and you don't really get into the more indie pendant cinema scene i think if you are just starting to get into independent cinema, like let's say you're starting to get into um, like Christopher Nolan, Fincher, the more uh, they're well known, but they're actually not very well known in the general public, like their names. So, for example, the people that I'm friends with who aren't movie buffs and don't work in Hollywood actually have no idea who David Fincher and Christopher Nolan, those names, they have no idea who, who those people are. And they don't have any idea or understand if there's any significance at all what an A24 movie is. Yes, no. They, they don't, they never go and watch A24 movies. Right. Ever. Um, so if you're just getting your feet wet into in indie movies, then I think this is, you'll probably enjoy this movie because it's not too obtuse, you know? There's some indie movies that are like, you throw someone new to that like genre probably gonna fall asleep yeah they'll be like what is this why did you recommend this to me um and the highlight of it in of this movie in my opinion uh, is the cgi the stunts obviously michelle yo is great now i asked you uh, like it didn't seem like there was a lot of cg in the movie what do you mean by cg this movie is very cg heavy in that it has a lot of music video commercial motion graphics effects in it so it's not cg like a marvel movie is obviously cg but anyone who's worked in motion graphics knows there's a lot of cg very poppy music video y i like the cinema uh cinephile cinema history Mm -hmm. type of nods that they did there's like a really i think one of my favorite dimensions in the movie is the wong carl y one where they don't actually end up together, but they lament that they never got together. So that's kind of neat. But yes, at the end of the day, this is a very fancy, fancy Marvel movie. It's getting a lot of attention. Yes. And like, in my opinion, I don't like that Hollywood likes to do this for for political woke points, where they highlight movies for it being an all Asian American cast or an all black cast or whatever. And I, I, I just go like, you know, this is a fine movie. I think Parasite deserved what it deserved legitimately. Legitimately. Regardless of it being an Asian movie or whatever. Like I, this movie though, to me feels a little bit political, mm-hmm. politicized. And, and that doesn't taste well in my mouth because when you do that, it doesn't the people in Hollywood know and it's not like they get more opportunities because they were suddenly nominated because it was like some kind of political thing you know what I mean like you you would think that if you're nominated for best director best actor best whatever you would want to do it fair um, and for 
not political reasons because you want to get that next movie you want to get that next role that whatever the, the bigger better thing people in hollywood know when it's a sham and they're not going to give you that next role if they know it was just for for appearance's sake and so and it, it just makes you look weird it makes hollywood look kind of weird to like celebrate a movie simply because there's uh, asians yeah it's a little in my opinion kind of racist but okay whatever it's hollywood it's Hollywood, yeah. Of course they would. Um, All right. Okay. Well, I'm sure you've probably seen that movie, but how about a movie you probably haven't seen? What's the next movie on the list? The next movie, number nine, is Tar. Oh, Tar. Yes. Starring Kate Blanchett, right? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This movie, um, the reason why it's so special is because it has a really interesting, unique, poignant message for our times right now um whether or not it's executed the best it could be is up in the air which is why it is number nine um it's long it's very long i think it's like three hours long and i would say it's not the kind of long where it's like oh you just don't have the attention span i think there's a lot of repetitive shots yeah. and um I'll, i mean it's a little <laughs> intense to have the credits roll in the big all of the credits roll in the beginning but that's fine i thought that was like oh kind of classy i guess but then you soon realize that it's it just goes a little long in the tooth and uh i remember thinking that for the first hour i was thinking like where is this going and all of a sudden things actually happen in the last 45 30 minutes and and the plot really starts to thicken but like it, it kind of meanders i say in the in the first hour mm. Yeah, it's it's just way too long. I, I I remember feeling like there is a really good cut of the movie in here, in this three hour long movie. There, like halfway into the movie, I was confused why it was still going on, because where like or like where is this going? Like this just feels date like life and times of Tar, the musician, uh, intense genius, yeah, lady. And I was, it wasn't until the very, very, very end that it kind of felt. It feels like, oh, this is what the movie is yeah. about. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and that's fine. Uh, you can still do that. Just you lost me. Half like in about two hours in, I was like, oh my god, there's a whole hour of movie left. Um, this movie is for then people who are well pretty well versed in indie cinema and are kind of into dreary moody independent cinema um because it's a little bit obtuse to get through like i'm not going to recommend this to you to watch this if you're not already used to indie movies because otherwise you're gonna fall asleep <laughs> you're gonna be like why don't i watch this why did why did you recommend this to me? <laughs> this is why awful. tar over everything everywhere? It has, in my opinion, more interesting, unique story. I think it has uh, moments that are complex and make you think, and uh, kind of makes you look at current events and and just just like, there's just more thoughtfulness to it yeah. than everything everywhere. I think. And I think that's why we uh, put it above that movie. It's it's more um, ambiguous mm -hmm. what you're supposed to take out of it, because I being in the film Twitter uh, by proxy, just seeing some of the tweets about this movie. Um, some people take it one way, and some people take it the other way. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, you know? and I don't think this movie is making a value judgment either way i think it's just presenting um this character in this time and being like make of it what you will and it's really interesting in my opinion like it's really interesting who gets upset by the character and who doesn't and who is making some kind of value judgment about the movie and who doesn't like it, it's it says a lot about you i think how you how you react to this movie um, and I think that that's those are the type of movies that stick with me, that make me think, that challenge me. 
um, in ways that, you know, movies like Everything Everywhere don't tend to. I just kind of go, oh, fun movie. You, you told a very cut and dry, easy to understand movie. But, yeah, it's fine. I've seen this a million times before. It's fine. Um, what's number eight? Number eight is Banshees of Isherin. Isherin. <laughs> I'm sorry. I butchered that. <laughs> but yes, the Banshees of Isherin, uh, whose director was uh, also director for uh, In Bruges, The Guard, um, Three Billboards, which I, which I really, really liked that year that that came out. Uh, Seven Psychopaths. Uh, truthfully told, I have a lot of contention with Janet, this movie, because I really like this director and I prefer almost all of his movies than this one. But for some strange reason, reason Janet really likes this movie. So why do you, why do you like this movie? <laughs> I think it's funny and I think the characters are really charming. Um, I relate to Mad-Eye Moody, <laughs> the guy that plays, um, the guy that is like, don't talk to me or I'll chop off my fingers. Um, I also have a soft spot for slice of life type movies. Um, I think you have a problem with it mostly because it doesn't have much of a story. I feel like it doesn't go anywhere. Hmm. And though it's a uh, meditation in seems like antisocial behavior <laughs> or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, it's, it has fun moments. There, Barry Kogan is in the movie and mm -hmm. he's great. He's really, really fun to watch in that movie. But ultimately, uh, I just don't see the point at the end of it. I don't understand what, what it's about really. I think it's just about life. I think, I think so. I <laughs> yeah. think so. But, uh, what, what is great is the chemistry between, um, Colin, Farrell, right? Is it Colin Farrell? I get it mixed up all the time. Colin Farrell and uh, Mad, -Eye, Mad Eye Moody. Uh, also, Colin Farrell's sister is really, really good in the movie, too, I think. I think every actor in this movie is great. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is partly what makes me love it so much. If the actors weren't as good, I don't think I would like this movie. Um, but every actor sells it um, for me. They make This movie makes me laugh, like, in this kind of dark humor kind of way. Um, I remember watching it in theaters and people were so confused what they were watching, but I loved I it. See, I felt like people were getting mad at us laughing. And I'm like, have you not seen any of this guy's movie? You don't, you don't understand. This is dark comedy. <laughs> I don't under, like people really took it for some existential something movie. Take it seriously. And it's just like, no, 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 no. This isn't, this isn't that kind of movie. Why Banshees over Tar and everything everywhere? I don't have as many problems with Banshees as I do with the runtime of Tar mm -hmm. and the basicness of everything everywhere. Like, fair enough, yeah. The only problems I have with it is, like, you're right, it's kind of just about nothing, which is what slice of life movies are, but then I like slice of life movies, so maybe that's just my bias. Mm. Um, and, like, I haven't watched In Bruges. Um, oh, so but cool. I did watch Three Billboards and Seven Psychopaths. You know what I mean, right? Like this guy, he usually makes movies about stuff or at least like fun, quirky characters. And this mm -hmm. movie does have fun, quirky characters. I just feel like ultimately there's a point or a conflict at the end and it just kind of ends, I think. But I, yes, I did find it more memorable than Tar and Everything Everywhere just because I think the, the, the movie's more airtight than, than the other two, and the performances are really good, mm -hmm. really strong, big, strong cast. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand, but I also, there's just something, like, that speaks to me about the style of this slice of life story, the way it's being told. Mm -hmm. Like, Seven Psychopaths and Three Billboards has a, has a tone, has a very specific tone to each of those movies but this also has its very very specific tone that's slightly that's like different in a nice kind of way in a more androgynous kind of way like as a woman i like it mm. a little bit more actually than the like <laughs> pretty male yeah pretty like, those other movies tend to be. yeah mm, interesting um so the seventh movie on our list is Directed by Janet Chan's least favorite director. 
of all time. Who wants to be considered, you know, one of those. A serious director. Auteur, yeah. So, Janet, what's the seventh movie on our list? The Whale. Whale. This is my favorite movie from Darren Aronofsky. What? I have to say. What? More than more than The Wrestler? That was just my favorite movie? That's second. That comes second for me. Oh, wow, it's first for me. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Um... This movie is fantastic because it has a very tight, beautiful story um, and really great acting from Brendan Fraser. Or not necessarily, I went, to be more specific, a really amazing transformation from Brendan Fraser. Um, he plays this crazily overweight man. Um, and the, it's an adaptation from... For, for, from a play um and i think it works really really well and really really simply for the story um another performance worth mentioning is uh the young lady from stranger things the ginger one mm-hmm. she plays uh brendan fraser's daughter and uh there's a lot of conflict between them and she does an awesome job at kind of being the source of conflict the villain in the movie um which was really surprising because everyone just talks about Brendan Fraser, but there's mm-hmm. the, the cast isn't actually that bad. The it's cast really strong. is great, yeah. I like everyone in it. Um, it's I it's this high on the list partly because I'm thoroughly impressed by Darren Aronofsky's restraint. Well, what's your usual criticism for Aronofsky? He's just so tastelessly tryhard. Um, is the way I would describe it. I don't appreciate how he's taken from other movies so blatantly. Um, it borderlines on plagiarism. In school, if you did the same thing, you would be called out for plagiarism. I think you'd be expelled. Yeah, which is my huge biggest problem with this director. Um, and... I, but like surprisingly, maybe I haven't watched enough movies. Maybe he's doing it again because <laughs> in almost every single movie I've seen him blatantly plagiarize. Um, but like uh, this, I'm not seeing that, and I genuinely feel like he's not doing too much for once, <laughs> and that really helped the movie just do its thing well. It helped Brendan Fraser do his thing. It helped the story do its thing. And, like, that's what I like about it. I don't think the cinematography or anything else about the movie is particularly outstanding. But, um, definitely, if you're into drama, um, dramatic movies and acting set forward movies, it's something you would like. Yeah, and, uh, drama writing and playwriting, especially, you mm-hmm. want to keep, uh, the locations to a minimum as possible that way you don't have to like you know have intermission and then change the entire scenery but like it, i think it's it's kind of amazing uh the t- the, the kind of shots that they chose mm-hmm. and uh the story that they told in just an apartment which is really inspiring for any young filmmaker who wants to just use the bare bones of what they have available and make a neat story um you have do you have any uh do you have any gripes about the movie? Yes. I've heard other people say this about the, the movie, and I didn't know what they're talking about until I watched the movie. But I, I do think the characters come across a little 2D and cartoonish. Um, it, it, to be... You didn't understand my gripe with it, but I guess the best way I can explain it is each character feels a little bit of like a stereotype Mm. of that character you imagine what a morbidly obese person would be like that's exactly what you would get you imagine what a angsty teenager and the kind of cruel things a teenager say to their parents um (laughs) that's that's exactly what you would imagine and it's just to me two-dimensional but who is this Did, did we talk about who this movie is for for people who like drama. Oh, uh, okay. All right. And uh, Brendan Fraser. Uh, Brendan Fraser is going up against another actor on uh, this list of movies. So we'll talk about who should win best actor. <laughs> once if, we get there. Once we get there. So, Janet, mm-hmm. there is a uh, another movie on our list that we 
really championed and we wouldn't shut up about mm -hmm. what is the sixth movie on our list of best movies in 2022 emily the criminal wow Probably this... haven't watched that movie, you guys. You guys should see that yeah. movie. It's really good. It's really <laughs> Most good. people probably haven't seen it. Um, it's also kind of like Tar, poignant, in that it's very now in the t in terms of the story. Um, it's, it, I think, on this list, the most relatable movie for millennials and gen, uh, late, early Gen Z, older Gen Z. Um, it's really, really, really particularly relatable for people who've just started working, trying to figure out how to pay off their student loans. Mm. <laughs> just life is hitting you hard fast. And it has certain criticisms for everyone else. <laughs> um, it's a concise movie. Unlike a lot of these other movies, it's what, like 90 minutes long? Oh, yeah. Um, really sharp 90 minutes, man. Yeah. I wish movies would just stick to that 90 minutes, for God's sake. Um, to be able to do that is difficult, it seems, because no one does that anymore. Um, and it's well, in that uh, vein, it's really well executed um, because of it. It's, it's just a tight movie, a tight script, really great acting from Audrey Plaza. Because it's very low budget in vibe, and I assume also technically very low budget. It's a, it's based. You should watch it if you are a millennial or Gen Z who's aspiring to become a filmmaker. It's stories like this that you could probably write and tell in for very very dirt cheap. Yeah, I kept saying that this movie is and should belong up there, especially since it takes place in Los Angeles. It belongs up there with Reservoir Dogs by Tarantino and Hard Eight by PTA. It's just that strong, especially since all those movies are um, kind of the first attempts, first movies, first movies by all those directors. Uh, it's just a very strong movie about crime. And, the, and the, this, the, what I love about it is the crime isn't even grandiose like like Reservoir Dogs where you have like all these characters who were like wear ties and and have secret code names. No, this is a simple movie about someone who wants to do credit card fraud. And it's and, and, and every every time I wa we watched it twice and I just kept thinking it, it just keeps hitting me in the face that like I can't believe how simple this movie is. It, like Jane and I are all about simplicity and uh, this is one of those movies where I'm just like damn I wish we made this movie it's so simple it's it's the locations are so simple just a few warehouses and, and like a mall and, and it's, just, it's just ridiculous how much you could get away with if you're if you just have like a strong imagination so that's I, I just I remember watching this in the theater going like I can't believe this movie right now this is like such a simple beautifully told uh, what did they call it in the trailer? Pressure cooker mm. of a thriller. <laughs> Very strong. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's great. Aub Aubrey Plaza is fantastic. It's just, please see that. Please see this movie. It's mm -hmm. so good. Are you a movie aficionado cinephile? And do you like good coffee? Well, I got a great recommendation for you. Coffee Brand Coffee is the number one trusted source for caffeine in the entire galaxy. See it. 5% off your entire order. Enter code Honey and Absinthe at checkout at the link down below. What is number five on our list? Number five is a movie called Triangle of Sadness. Janet, what's so great about this movie? Um, the main thing I absolutely loved about this movie is that it's beautiful. Um, the next standout thing is it's humorous and smart because this is a satire i don't remember too many satires coming out uh recently in the past mm -hmm. decade feels like there were none and then all of a sudden 2022 there were two satires that were yeah. very poignant um the it's poignant but it's not like super deep <laughs> I think it's just about like making fun of rich people. It's it's a classist story. Well, making fun of rich people and commenting on the way 
human nature would work if if you just threw all the different classes in t- on an island and went did some kind of lord lord of the flies human experiment <laughs> on them um you talked about uh this movie being beautiful what what like what there's a lot of beautiful movies out there what what's so special about this one rarely do i see a, a piece of entertainment that makes me go I think this is going to be stolen and used for the next decade in terms of the style in which it was shot. So in the past 10 years or so, um, that really underexposed look and shallow depth of field has been really popular from TV shows to movies. Think of Netflix, anything Mm -hmm. on Netflix. Daredevil, like people complain that you can't see anything. Um, Or the shallow depth of field is to kind of mask how little of a budget you have for production design. Yeah, Um, and everything is color corrected to be kind of dreary and dark and (laughs) bluish overall. Um, Can you describe what triangle of sadness is doing cinematography wise what i've noticed a lot of forward looking movies have done fairly recently is when something's been overdone and people are like kind of tired of it they do the opposite so um instead of shallow depth of field it's a really uh what what's the word the opposite of shallow so there's not Everything too much bokeh. And focus. yeah exactly yeah. there's um which means that the set has to be designed mm-hmm. and beautiful um even though i would okay. consider this movie a smaller budget movie com- compared to you know marvel movies and stuff like that it still looks amazingly high budget because of that um it's also really colorful, mm. but without being like everything everywhere, without being in your face. Colors in your face, big palette. It's just it has a very uh, restrained palette, but but for for once you're seeing something that's not just gray and blue. Yeah, saturation. Saturation for once. Right. Um, there's this amazingly composed shot of when uh, there's this shot on an island. And it's like a painting, the way the blues and teals in the shadow and then the warmth and uh, they do over under exposure and dappled lighting just so beautifully. I've never... I don't Which even, is hard to do, right? Yeah, it's extremely hard to do. You have to pick one or the other or you... <laughs> ha- there's actually a lot of manipulation of light to make it look right if you want you want it to look right um like just (laughs) like um flags you put all these like um soft softening of the light stuff like i'm sure the cinematographer went to town especially with the exterior shots on the island um it's just so beautiful it's so amazingly beautiful that I'm pretty sure this is where we're going because this is kind of where we've been going um people just you know and you have to get people used to it so for example in 1917 um Deacons doesn't actually like shallow (laughs) depth of field he he likes to show the set because it's more naturalistic um and I I've been liking it too just as like I want to be able to see things. I'm so sick and tired of like dark, dreary, gray, uh, desaturated Zack Snyder (laughs) looking stuff. Um, I want color, but not garish color the way Marvel movies tend to be. Right. You'd say, you'd probably say Triangle of Sadness is the most beautiful movie on this list that you would, if we had an award to give to the cinematographer, we would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, like, this deserves to win Best Cinematography. It's not going to. No, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, what number four? <laughs> number four is a remake of an Akira Kurosawa movie, which is an adaptation of a Leo Tolstoy book, uh, Living, which is an adaptation of Ikaru, which is an adaptation of... Um, 
Oh, shoot. I forget. Uh, oh, yeah. Death of Ivan Ilvish. Uh, so Janet Chan, we, I, I, I wept. <laughs> I wept like a little baby. Uh, what is great about living? So, so much, actually. It's a really classic and effective story with good acting, um, to sum it up. But we watched Ikaru beforehand because I wanted to know, since it's obviously an adaptation of a beloved, beloved classic movie, I was like, but I have to watch this. Like, I was okay. I actually watched the beginning of Ikaru a while ago, but we never finished it because, I don't know, we got busy or something. So then this time we were like, okay, we're going to sit down and we're going to watch it all the way through. And I absolutely, I think... Ikaru is probably my second top favorite Kurosawa movie. What's your favorite Kurosawa movie? High and Low. Oh, definitely. Um, I Coincidentally, too, I, for whatever strange reason, got bored. And I read Death of Ivan Ilvich uh, during Christmas time, right before we watched uh, Ikaru. And I remember after the first 10 minutes of Ikaru, I was like, what the hell is it? This is this is Death of Ivan Ilvich. What's going on here? And little did we know until we finished the movie that uh, we looked up the Wikipedia details, and it is uh, Kurosawa and friends did adapt T- Tolstoy's little novella about this dying workaholic man. Mm. Uh, but what I found really uh, beautiful is that he expounded upon Tolstoy's story because Tol- because Death of Ivan Ilvich is like this bitter workaholic guy who suddenly realizes his mortality at the end of all things of his life. Uh, and it's really, really dreary because it literally ends with the uh, last moments of his his being alive. Mm-hmm. But uh, the beautiful part, and if you've ever seen Ikaru, the most beautiful part of Ikaru is what happens after the protagonist passes away. Mm-hmm. It's... It, it does this completely like this narrative shift, which is fascinating. If you have not watched Ikaru, you need to watch it. It's a must-watch movie in my. It's just it's like what are you doing? It's like stop what you're doing and watch Ikaru. What are you doing? It's just god tier in terms of oh, yeah. movie. Um, even though it's in black and white, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people don't like the idea of black and white movies. Blah, blah, blah. If but you like, want to get on our level, <laughs> get used to it, man. Black and white movies are amazing. Yeah. A lot oh of them God. are amazing. One of my favorite types of movies. Um, Color is so distracting. Yes. If you were to ask me. So, obviously, it <laughs> a lot to prove. We living, had high expectations yeah, for living. Living had a lot to prove. So... What really amazed us about it was that it's a great adaptation of the movie. Um, it's not exactly the same because it can't be. It it takes place in um, Britain. In Britain, yeah, yeah, in London. London. And it it, it just culturally, it's going to be different from a Japanese movie about the exact same thing. Um, and a lot oftentimes you see things typically anime or stuff like that taken from japan and then reinterpreted for a western audience it's not easy (laughs) it's really not easy to do it faithfully but also do your own thing and i think uh, it was it did a good job and also bill nighy is great do um following the footsteps of the the actor who did a great job in Ikaru. Um, But telling it in his own way. Yeah. It's really neat. More subdued, uh, less overdramatic, but still heartfelt. And uh, when the character shift happens, it's it's really beautiful to see. So Bill Nighy is in the running for best actor against Brendan Fraser. (laughs) So who do you think should win best actor, Bill Nighy or... uh, Brendan Fraser. Bill Nye. Ah, why? Because I think he completely embodies the role in such a subdued, beautiful way that he the the acting aspect of it completely disappears. Hmm. I don't even believe he's acting sometimes. But kind of like when you watch a play or um 
you know when someone's obviously acting like i'm acting and that's what brendan fraser is which is like the it's amazing that these two uh roles are up against each other because they're like polar opposites Mm -hmm. of what acting can be one that's really showy and like obviously i'm transforming into this character that i am not um and the other is like like can be taken for granted but I think is more effective as some like what I look for in actors is like can I tell you're acting or not right yeah I I would choose Brendan Fraser because uh Bill Nye is fantastic it's so good amazing like I can't even say enough uh praise for Bill Nye but I do think it's a little derivative of the character in Ikaru because it has to he is he kind of has a roadmap whether or not he watched Ikaru or not in preparation, uh, it's still kind of the same person. And I kind of feel like I've seen that before, been there, done that. But I've never seen um, uh, a man struggling with his weight. It's always usually a joke in movies like Nutty Professor and the way Eddie Murphy transformed his body and like wore all the prosthetics for Nutty Professor. But it is really, I understand that it's a very Brendan Fraser, I'm acting kind of movie. But he fucking act, he acts. The guy acts his heart out, uh, which is, um, I think, in a very uh, like gut wrenching way. And and he's like covered in sweat, and and it looks pretty real to my eyes. Uh, it's it's a performance that I think is a little bit more memorable. But you're right, Bill Nye's performance is very subdued but that's kind of the point of of his performance Mm -hmm. so uh brendan fraser edges out a little bit for me but like uh i want to live in a world where yeah uh, bill nye could win Mm. the oscar but he's not going to so this movie is for people who like sentimental existential movies um like it's a wonderful life a christmas carol uh, movies like that that make that like gut punch you <laughs> and but like you like it like you want to cry at the end um that this is that's the this is the movie for you quick aside if you were to compare ikaru and living what are your thoughts on that because you had a lot of thoughts on that after what, what do you watched, mean compare uh how what do you think about the deviations and additions that they added to living oh um i don't like that living is too in my opinion too short actually Mm -hmm. um the things that they cut out i don't know if that was a good idea because i in order to get the full weight of the situation i feel like ikaru needed to be that long um i didn't feel like ikaru was too long though too like i think it was exactly the right length for the story it was trying to tell um (laughs) There are some weird things about Japanese behavior and culture that's that can come across a little weird and pervy. Um, so I'm glad that they changed that aspect of it in living. Yeah, having a little more of that British class yes. you know, stature and things. But uh, I think um, in some ways, living ties up a lot of the loose ends in Ikaru. Uh, mm-hmm, yeah. the, in a very convenient way, which is satisfying for the movie. But you think uh, you you think you like Ikaru more because it's so much more open ended. Yeah, I want. I would rather come to the conclusion that it is kind of just handed to you on a silver platter and at living, the end of living yeah. on my own, mm-hmm. rather than um, in a very Hollywood fashion, telling me the lesson of the movie in a concise way. (laughs) I don't like that. Um, And I also... uh, What was it that... Oh, I also, because I am who I am, I like that Ikaru doesn't pull any of its punches, meaning it's cruel. It's cruel in the way it treats some of the characters in the movie. It's cruel in the way that that's how life is. Like, that... (laughs) It, 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 there are some moments in the movie that makes you feel bad, but you're like, oh, but that's life. Yeah. That's such a pointed observation. Living people are. mimics those same beats, but it's almost it's as, a little bit more Hollywood yeah. and fluffy and like, 
it doesn't want to make you feel that bad because mm-hmm. tonally it would be out of place. It's not that much of a feel bad movie, but mm-hmm. uh, Kurosawa was so much more uh, unforgiving about uh, about how the events turn out in in Ikaru. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I don't like too much Hollywood um, taking care of my feelings kind of thing in in a movie. I want a movie to go there. And when they do, I I like I like a plot. I go like, wow, I can't believe you went there, but you did. And I just like it's it's gonna drive me insane that Kurosawa is the one that did it first <laughs> in all instances. Um, so yeah. we're reaching the last three movies on our list. I think this third movie is gonna be the biggest shocker on this list. And uh, do we mean it when we say with this movie? is more poignant more i don't know stand will stand the test of time maybe will i don't know do you really believe that this movie is better than you know the other seven movies that we just mentioned yes which is really harsh to say yes better than living triangle of sadness emily with a whale banshees tar everything everywhere mm-hmm. what is this third best movie of the year it's babylon what the fuck directed by damien chazelle <laughs> what i think this movie is going to stand the test of time in that like if you've ever just as a film buff went back in history at all the oscar nominated movies um best for best picture or best director some the one some of the ones that win aren't the ones that are remembered of that era we always cite the year uh the sting one in Mm -hmm. the 70s but you know the most memorable movie that that was uh, up against Sting that stood the test of time was The Exorcist. Yeah, that everyone talks about, everyone references for horror movie. It's a classic must-watch movie. If like, in, if you were to take a Cinema 101 course, you'd probably have to watch this movie. And yet, The Sting was the one that won that year. So there's so many instances of that when you're going back in history and being like, oh, that's interesting. That's fascinating what people thought was the best of that time. But like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, and no, I don't think anyone at, the, at that time would have predicted, oh yeah, Exorcist is the movie everyone's gonna actually remember. Um, and I think Babylon is gonna be that movie for this year <laughs> because it's amazing how many people slept on this movie. And how many film people specifically really, really enjoy this movie and are very thoroughly confused why it got such poor reviews and kind of got slammed in the media. I can I can tell you why, because it's it's poignant in that it's a really well written satire, um, and it's brave. Probably up there with the network, you'd say. Yes. Whoa. Network, um, I mean, come on. <laughs> like, it takes... Yeah, I think if we think of the greatest satire, <laughs> yeah. Chayefsky's network is just god tier. Yes. Like how Ikaru is like a god tier movie. Yeah. Um, but this movie, it's. I applaud it for being brave. And I can understand why the Hollywood marketing uh, machine didn't really want people to watch it um but for that reason i think that's why i like it it goes against the grain in much of the same way i feel like exorcist did Mm. um or movies in the 70s did like i i really feel like we're going towards movies that go against the grain in in the way it's shot in the way it's told in in the way subject matter yeah the characters are um, I think the past decade has been going with the grain. Everything about like PC culture, all that stuff, has been very, very in vogue. But all of a sudden, this year, or last year technically, we saw so many movies that were like, no, fuck that. <laughs> I want, I need to say something because I'm so sick and tired of being like told to be a certain way or this is the right way to think and act. And a lot of our favorite movies and this year this past year has been movies that were like no let's say something interesting say something that people have been afraid to say 
for a really, really long time. Just even just to mention it clearly, like movies like Tar, to to even present, uh, almost like documentarian style, rather than have have a point, have a message. People already take that the wrong way, and then they they are for or against it. And I'm like, good. <laughs> We need more movies like this that make you think.、Um, What about Babylon? You think will stand the test of time? Like, what is it specifically about this movie? Is it is it the writing? Is it? I think、mm. it's the writing. I think it's the story. I think a lot of people will be able to relate to it. You would like this movie if you've also worked in an industry with a lot of pol- politics involved and nepotism, corruption.、Um, it's I liken it to like Office Space, even though it's completely a different movie. It's similar.、Um, I think the message isn't as obvious as Office Space, but it's like that.、Um, I think that's why it's going to stand the test. It actually says something. Yeah, it actually says something. It uses the entire scope of cinema to say what it wants to say, and、uh, yeah, I think this movie is a movie that couldn't have existed before,、uh, and it kind of says a lot that it exists now, and it makes me want to believe like how Triangle of Sadness is very forward in its、uh, visual storytelling. I think. And, and another movie in this list is very forward in its way it presents special effects, but Babylon, it's sort of what I like. I want, wish, and I kind of expect movies that are going to be like from here on out. That they're not. I I think I said on the review for Babylon that、um, the time of、uh, the Gen X Tarantino's filleting Hollywood. Era is over,、mm-hmm. and we're unlike you know the millennials are taking over, and they finally I think with Babylon and so many of these other instances is like we found our voice.、Yeah. There's many similarities <laughs> between Babylon and Emily too, so、uh, it's it's really interesting to see where we're going to take cinema、uh, in the future.、Yeah. So and it's really exciting for the first time. It's like. It's you know it's exciting exciting to see visual stuff and and good cinematography, but when when there is a voice. And and sort of like an overarching theme that we're going to carry into the decade, man, makes things super exciting as a moviegoer. I'd say. I think so too. I like twenty twenty two seems to have marked something in the decade where we're like, no, no, enough of this filleting Hollywood bullshit. <laughs> enough of that. Let's. As millennials, we're finally coming into our own and being like, we we've lived enough life to have a few complaints, and we have a very unique way of complaining. <laughs> using what you love against you, <laughs> using the industry against you, it's so awesome. <laughs> so Jan Chan, we are in the last two movies of the list. This second movie, kind of a sleeper. Pretty sure you haven't seen this movie, the audience. What is the second movie on this list, and why is it better than Babylon Living, Triangle of Sadness, Emily, The Whale, Banshees, Tar, and Everything Everywhere All at Once? In fact, I would say I adore this movie more than Everything Everywhere All at Once, which it shares a lot of、uh, similarities. similarities with. What is the second movie on our list? R R R. What? What? What is R R R, Janet? R R R is an over-the-top, action-packed Bollywood musical, <laughs> and it is amazing. It's so entertaining. They have just the amazing, most amazing daring stunts. I think I have seen in a really long time,、um, and it's emotional. It's. Filled with so much passion, something about Bollywood movies that I really love is just how much energy and care goes into every little thing, <laughs> every little action,、mm-hmm. every little song. It's it's just nice to see that much passion in the making of a movie. <laughs> just the sheer like, I'm going to do this. 
Um, the movie that uh, I kept thinking, well, the two movies I kept thinking about watching RRR uh, was uh, The Departed and Infernal Affairs mm. because it shares a lot of that like cat and mouse uh, <laughs> frenemy stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I love about RRR, which is like so much a far cry, it just reminds me of those movies. It, there, It's as if um dicaprio and matt damon were like best friends <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. and it's the the bromance <laughs> in that in rrr that i love so much yeah. and uh it gets tragic it gets like really heartfelt and then it gets really really sweet by the end of the movie and 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 i i if if there's you know there's so much to praise with rrr like the the even though there's so much cg what they do with it even though sometimes it doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. with with the animals and, and like punching a tiger in the face, it's just super fun and visceral to watch. Like how they save the kid, yes. but like above <laughs> all is like this this bromance between two frenemies, and uh, I can't think of a better movie where I about frenemies. The only movie I think that this movie comes close to in a movie about frenemies, probably Toy Story. It's, it's that yeah, good. Yeah. It's that good. You know? <laughs> um, this movie is for people who like fun. It, like, uh, our list can be kind of hoity-toity, because that's kind of our taste sometimes. But for whatever reason, I came out of the past decade just tired. Tired of dreary movies. Tired of... Um, movies about existential crises and sadness and sometimes actually all the time i'm not so hoity-toity that i can't enjoy something that brings me back to like being a child and watching a movie and just wanting to be entertained when was the last time a movie genuinely made you cry laugh or oh or God. cheer or whatever it like like from from your depths <laughs> from your gut like you just want want to do that and i i sometimes feel that when i watch like a marvel movie or a star wars movie b back when you know the hype peak hype for those movies but never like this <laughs> never like like just cr just laughing every two seconds or just or just like, just like just like your smiling. jaws on the floor oh my god like, i can't happening? believe they did yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> So I I think the trend for me is that I yes I want um, movies that actually say something if it's going to be a serious movie, but if not, then entertain me like try. I don't know why, but a lot of Hollywood movies these days don't feel like they're trying, and that like I really appreciate this movie for just putting their all <laughs> into it and then genuinely making me laugh and like we were watching certain clips from it just for fun and it's still very entertaining no matter how many times i watch it it's just it makes me laugh every time oh man uh so we are in our number one movie of the year what does it look like when Hollywood actually tries? <laughs> it looks like Top Gun. Shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh, number one movie of the year. If you haven't watched it, what are you doing? Go watch Top Gun. Yeah. Uh, Maverick. Uh, it's a breathtaking, heartfelt, vis visceral action story. It's simple. But, like, what makes it like number one versus number 10 like everything everywhere even though in a lot of ways it shares the same genre like it's a blockbuster action movie that has a heartfelt story like it's i'd venture to even argue it has more going for it than everything everywhere because mm -hmm. it's not just about good guys versus bad guys it's a lot of the conflict comes from the team itself mm -hmm. and then you see uh, again th this frenemy theme but then ultimately coming together for a, for a common goal and to watch uh the senpai maverick do his thing which he always preaches that they could do these his his students could do the impossible and uh to watch them actually do it is such a uh riveting thing from like a human spirit perspective that has so much more going for it than everything everywhere and that's and we're just talking about and i'm just talking about like the 
like the character moments and and that stuff but like just the being able to be in a cockpit not and and having these deliberate shot choices that aren't just you know it could it could have just been a cg star wars type of like you know you're on the tail and you're like you're really flying through the air no you're just really inside the action for example uh tom cruise bobbing and weaving through the through the canyons is amazing when he throttles left throttles right and you just feel all of that in the camera i mean i understand there's a lot of cg layering going on but it's the presentation of it all it's mm -hmm. it's the it's the ethos of it all which which i think is going to carry into the decade yeah and the um the fact that like i have nothing against a blockbuster movie clearly like i love this mo this number one it, it I would, so if I were grading Top Gun and Everything Everywhere, I would say Everything Everywhere gets like an A minus, and Top Gun get, gets an A plus, in that like, they're both just doing the classic blockbuster movie exactly paint by numbers the way it should be. But where Everything Everywhere feels paint by number, an A plus is when someone goes above and beyond, like t dials it up to eleven, in terms of like, like you said, the presentation. Like you can do something well, and then there's doing something in a way that's unexpected, and like pulling out all the stops, going like going all the fucking way, um, and it's not as simple as following a formula, if you know what I mean. There has to be something special about it, special that you're doing. And it doesn't always mean <laughs> Tom Cruise flying a jet, practically, and, and every single actor in the movie actually flying a jet and filming themselves doing it and, and doing it flips in the air. But like you have to do something, something that like sets you apart um, something that just goes above and beyond what people are expecting and like RRR it's fun it's just pure it's so like just fun. what I wanted in 2022 what just set the one of the only things I'm gonna remember in 2022 is RRR and Top Gun like it's just that memorable of like uh, how good of a time I haven't felt in a long time in theaters watching a movie, and that's what that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted for the longest time. Every time I'd gripe about Hollywood, all I wanted was for them to make me feel that way, and I'm not complaining because you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think the takeaway here is that it's it can be done. Mm -hmm. You know, after being punched in the face for a whole decade about Hollywood making struggle session movies, yes, uh, it's possible through Top Gun that we can get back to business, back to basics, back to like uh, true lies and the terminate, just like pure fun and, and, and going to the theater and uh, coming together and enjoying uh, a piece that celebrates entertainment. And that's why I think Top Gun is. It ma makes me uh, appreciative and, and, and proud to be a movie fan. And I want to, I want to celebrate cinema. I don't want to keep taking a shit on almost all the movies that come out in the year like a lot of our fellow peers do on YouTube. That's not what I want to do. What I want to do is hopefully talk about every movie like how I talk about Top Gun. Mm. And uh, that's my best wish for for this decade. We're still very early on, but there's, you know, there's a glimmer of hope here with Top Gun and RRR and Babylon that I'm and then I'm like this is this could be a very special decade. Uh, it seems as though the 2010s were about excess and, and sort of wagging your finger. This just seems like, I don't know, just like attitudes coming back, um, pure fun and entertainment and cinema is coming back, and I'm all for it. Yes. What do you have to think and say about this decade? Or, you know, this, I don't know, what, what, do you, what are your last thoughts on, on, on the movies? The movies. I am optimistic, but I have a suspicion that, you know, other than indie movies that have a shorter production time, <laughs> that we won't see a lot of the trends that we're predicting until the latter half of the decade. 
because if you if you look back at like um the 70s 70s movies didn't really start looking like the 70s until the end yeah, like the very 76. end yeah and then like towards the end and like 78 79 it almost started looking like 80s movies yeah so it's like a really like short period of time yeah. where it was juicy it was good yeah. um so i i would say because we're coming out of a very similar time period and we're having a very similar reaction like like in the 70s i'm sure like in the late 20s of this decade we'll probably get some amazing movies and then and then who knows after that but i'm looking forward to it i'm me looking too. forward to it me too and we recommend you watch All any of the movies things. that you haven't seen and if you have rewatch them if you like, subscribe, jingle all our bells and buttons, check out these other episodes here to binge all our other episodes, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.